But today I want to share some religious ideas with y'all. Um... Hey, mental health allies. So I'm really excited about today's video. We're going to be talking about Seseska, the religion or cult that was created by Anissian. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to Wish for Death Island Population Me, and today we have our very first proper episode of Slicing the Onion, the series where I go through a detailed timeline of Gregory Daniels. I mean Gregory Jackson. I mean James Jackson. Uh, whoever the fuck Onion is. It's funny because I was initially planning to only make one video about his childhood because I was under the impression that it was only a couple of posts or something that I wouldn't really be able to find out more on when I started researching it, but when I went to the sites about Onion, including including the article on ED and the wiki and whatnot, I realized this was going to take more than one episode to cover all of it. And obviously I'm not going to be going over the boring bits, just the cringy ones, and there's a lot of those. A mess that was provided to you by Greg himself. This isn't something that he got doxxed for or something, this is just his, his words, what he wrote himself, his blogs from 2005 and earlier, and his early videos, it's all him. And it's, it's terrible, so you gotta wonder what was going through his mind for him to think that this sounded good. So to make a more interesting timeline, I'm covering his childhood in this video up to his hybrid eye website and his viewpoints on religion, and then I can talk about Seseska, his cult, which apparently started in 1997 according to him, so I can sort of move that around interchangeably. I also want to look at the clear inspiration that he took from certain things that he claimed happened in his childhood to form this cult, as is with cult members and cult leaders in general. In the next video I can continue his various websites and start talking about the forum. If you're familiar with a lot of Onision lore, you'll know that someone by the name of Medium Rare was talking about the forums from a personal standpoint and I will be going over some of the stuff that they said. Gregory Jackson was born on the 11th of November 1985. This makes him a 35 year old this year. He was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck three times and his mum was told before his birth that he might be retarded. His words. And when he was born, blue and still, his mum feared the worst but continued to raise him. His mother's name is Tammy Jane, I think, given by him on his blog, in a particular entry about his father, whom he names Randy Gray. He also, so he tells his audience, was raised by his mum and doesn't like the time that he spent with his dad. Keep in mind that this is all coming from him and we have seen his contradictions about his past in the past. He lies to keep himself in a sympathetic victim role, which I believe he thinks gives him a look of powerlessness to his potential victims so they don't suspect what he's really capable of, and he likes the pity so he can make money from it. Also the fact that he tries to attract a vulnerable young audience so they're gonna try and find similarities between him and them. But we are going to use what he says for this timeline because I think it gives us insight into why he behaves the way he does. And also, if he did make these things up, it still presents him as having the same pattern of lies and ma manipulation as even far back as 2009. So Greg grew up with his mum, and he says he didn't really realise how evil the guy was, though he would hear about how evil the guy was quite a lot. However, he only came to understand what they meant by him being evil and realise it was all true and more when he spent a six month period living with his dad. He claims his dad restricted him through modes of expression like music and entertainment in general and was violent and cruel. And even though Randy did terrible things, he never faced actual consequences from the law, although he did get letters and court summons from women who were testifying against him for his violent transgression. Greg says Randy treated Greg like a criminal even though Randy was the criminal and not Greg. And Greg fought tooth and nail to get out of that vile place and come back home with his mother, where he stayed and grew up. Randy then became a pastor in Ohio, and Greg says something along the lines of, I guess something good can come out of something very impure after all. How very pastoral of you. There are some things that I can see blossoming here. Firstly, you know what we're talking about with Onision's cult, Seseska, and a common thing about cults is restricting the ways the members can express themselves through art and whatnot because these ways of expression are deemed abnormal or somehow blasphemous against the group. This is something Randy allegedly did, and now Greg follows the path. Not in just his cult, but in the way that he tries to allegedly pressure and restrict his victims and his audience in general. Like shaming them if they weren't sexual in the way that he liked, even shaming black women for having hair that he didn't like, and trying to make it about them being dumb instead of different, rising above them as if he's superior, or he tried pushing feminism down people's throats and saying that they shouldn't be allowed to do things that was against that thing when he was in that type of way, I'm not sure what his stance on feminism is now. Next, his father treating him like a criminal when Randy himself was the criminal apparently. We have seen Greg try to discredit his critics by saying that they are child molesters and drug addicts, who smoke illegal drugs like he said about Billy. And he always brings up how he is not breaking any laws when people criticize his actions, he is obsessed with the law. 
he has an obsession with picking out different things about it, reading it out, and saying that he's innocent because of this. I just think that is very interesting, but keep it with a grain of salt because we don't really trust the source that much. Now we move on to age 2. Remember, this is all from his blog in 2005. And this is when he fell on his head from sitting on a church pew, splitting his head open and making his mom run screaming out of the church. He kept pulling bandages off and they kept putting more on, which resulted in the scar that he has to this day. He has commented before, although I'm too lazy to go looking for these clips, about how if you fall down or get injured, God doesn't care about you and how he hates religion or something, and I can still see him really salty about this kind of thing. Now, I'm not religious, so I'm not offended particularly, but I just think it's funny how much of his hate from religion seems to come from him being yeeted by a bench when he was two. As a seven-year-old in grade two, Greg had his first ever love. Her name was Aubrey, and he was infatuated with her for an entire year before the feelings faded by grade three. But why? Why does love fade? There was a boy, his name was Philip, can I make it any more obvious? He talked some smack, Greg wanted to fight, he got yeeted again. Well, Philip was saying that he was Aubrey's boyfriend when Onision got mad at it. And Onision also got mad because of the shit that Phil talked, and decided to ask the girl if he could beat up Philip in front of her, and she says go ahead, what the fuck ever, and Greg gets knocked over but they still fight until a teacher breaks them up, and then he and Phil were alright until Phil died from a sled accident two years later. Am I on AO3? Am I on fanfic.net? Am I in hell? This is what happened in his school, Lakeview Elementary in Auburn, Washington. He says by the time he was 14, he became like a guard from all of the fights that he got into. I guess that's his like Ranger's Apprentice origin story or something. Because even though he wasn't the strongest, he needed to fight off the bullies because he found a passion for saving people and he was naturally above average compared to everyone else, so it was his duty to use his abilities to help. He made friends with the children he saved, including the one time where he saw 15 plus bullies throwing stuff at some poor kid on a field at school. I must save him, Greg thought to himself, and rushed forwards, fighting all 15 plus kids and making them run away. He helped the kid to his feet, and the kid was like, you saved my life, and Greg says, I was just doing what was right, and then he went to his home planet. I actually do think that Greg is above average, because it does take a particular talent to type on a computer while simultaneously fellating yourself. I could never do that. He should be in the circus. He should be in a museum. I would have thought he's also above average in the chromosome count, I reckon, but apparently the hospital staff before he was born thought so as well. When Greg reached the age of 11, he had his first kiss. Her name was Julia and she was 15. And she was so beautiful to Greg, he was using was at the time because he was a child then, okay? And they kissed after they met at his father's church. However, twas not to be as she fell in love with a boy who was one year younger named Michael, and Greg only found out about this one year later, so they parted ways. For now, they are both kids at this point, and I might just be being a pearl-clutching bitch right now, but I want to point out that I think it is very creepy for a 15-year-old to kiss an 11-year-old in that sense, I guess. Because I think a 15-year-old is way more mature than an 11-year-old. They see two different stages or angles of life. It's like if a 15-year-old dated an 18-year-old, an adult, you have a completely different life experience and one of you has way more of an understanding of what you're doing and a consent of that and it is taking advantage in my opinion, especially since she apparently told Greg you have the mind of a 15-year-old. That comes across as a grooming thing to say and he was convinced that he always had a mind of someone older, like it helped his superiority complex, sure, but it also gives his want for younger girls a new light because he also says he feels like he's a boy and not a man, and calls men boys because they don't come across as men, and he does not act like a man. Whatever the fuck that means, he is in his late 20s at this point. Greg believes that the spirit and the physical body are two different types of things as we'll get into later, but we can tell from this belief that he thinks that he is both older and younger, older in mind and perhaps younger in body, and it, it feels like it's a big excuse about why he feels he can go after girls as young as 14 nowadays, and especially when a 15 year old kissed him when he was 11, that's just inappropriate. He says that when he was 15, he, he fell for Michael's sister, Jennifer, and says that she did not know anything about boys, and he liked that because he always thought of himself as a teacher anyways? So he confessed and wrote a letter to her, and she get, she gives him a call on the phone, and it doesn't go anywhere, but she still visits him when he goes to see his dad, and she keeps looking like she's gonna say something, but she doesn't. The fanfic angst. 
He did a Draw My Life video where he talks about the women he met a little bit after the blog post. I think he was in his 20s and yet he is still recalling Aubrey with the same love and awe and sexual nature when he, from when he was, what, 11, 7? I don't know. It's unnerving. He's talking about all these women like he loved them and he's super fucking sensitive. Like he's trying to be a romantic novel character and then his scorn for women comes out and he needs to be a constant victim as well. So all these stories end in him being cucked by these women. He gets cucked by all of them. He is the ultra cuck. Like it is unhealthy. He made the stories up too. So he's making up stories about being cucked even more than he was already cucked and then thinking it will make him look more appealing to women. Why this is is beyond me. But for some teenage girls it works. Teenage girls were all over this guy at one point. Back in the 90s, Greg came across his first encounter with pure evil in the form of a demon named Gila, 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 Big G, who came to him after a Ouija board session at Greg's cousin's house, but it was his first Ouija board session, so he did not understand the horrors that were about to come. And this demon told him that he was not ever possessed, the demon has seen through. Greg's eyes 19 times and would continue to see through his eyes and he liked Greg. Right. Also remember Big G because this comes back so fucking hard when we get to this cult stuff. Big G is the name of the fucking Satan demon in the cult religion. It's nuts but he honestly fucking thinks this shit and he thinks he has the right to call other people especially his detractors insane. Now we get to his first website. Although these stories are from 2005 and 2006 we can backtrack a bit to the early maybe 2001 or 2002 era of his websites so that his online presence and timeline of his age can kind of meet and we can continue with them on the same level. This is an archival website for photos and advice from 5th to 8th grade, which featured classic topics like my thoughts on 9-11. Lovely. This was called Ink and looked pretty edgy. All of his websites looked edgy because he was always into the MySpace emo shit. I'm goth as fuck, so I'm not judging people who are, but I think there's a big difference between loving the style and making it your own and still thinking your hot shit with an out-of-date cringe that you think gives you substance when in reality it just makes you look try hard. Anyway, moving on from his website, we have Cries of the Crypt. I'm pretty sure this could have been named Cries of My Eyes because the green on green looks fucking awful. And again, this features the ink logo. He ended up making a short-lived web design business thing and he tried to promote it called Sins Within Ink. And this is just like the babby version of that. But Crypt was a free host site and had a hate mail page where it was only used by one person named Devin who says skateboards are better than rollerblades and called Greg a cum sucking queer. Devin, son, are you okay? Next we have The Gamer Shadow. This one is not an archive for per personal shit like his previous sites, but rather a website that was like a aggregate for stuff about games and music, where he actually hired people to write for him. And he had a co-owner in, in essence, I guess, and his name was o Odikun at the time, later changed to Odd, which was listed as the webmaster, Greg I mean. He would be the one posting threads about all the drama on the website, which is hilarious. There were music and reviews and articles, and at one point there was a drama where people, including ex-members, raided or something, and their threads on the forum were deleted. And then after that, one of the reviews was plagiarized. The, the reviewer plagiarized something from IGN and then got found out, and then he got kicked out and tried to organize a raid and then got kicked out again. This was from 2001. In 2002, we get Hybrid Eye. This was only around for less than a year before it got yeeted as well. He was going by odd at this point, and this was a major aggregate site for him where he mainly used it for his design business and his content in here and stuff like that. It was just an another aggregate thing. So now, keeping in mind religion, I guess, we're going to talk about the thing that you came here for, Seseska. Now, I have mentioned before, but long ago, I really liked this book on cults by Arthur Diekman. It's an amazing secondary resource as well as just a good read in general you can just just read it so i have a few quotes that i always pull and apply when talking about cults and i want you to keep this in mind because i'll be bringing them up again while looking at what onision has tried to create because it's creepily similar and spoopy from page 73 of the book the structure of cults is basically authoritarian obedience and hierarchical power tend to take precedence over truth and conscience when they conflict, which they often do. Unfortunately, certain psychological benefits can make authoritarian groups very attractive. They provide the opportunity to feel, feel protected and cared for. And from Diekman's idea of indoctrination of a cult, 
it's boiled down to four key things. One, compliance with the group. Two, dependence on the leader. Three, devaluing the outsider. Four, avoiding dissent. This can also be called the dependency dream, being looked after by a parental figure and regressing into an earlier childlike state. It's very appealing to some people who especially might be feeling insecure and not like they belong, which are the primary targets for a cult. I will bring these up again as we go along in the series later on when we talk about how his audience is affected and how he gets his younger followers to become like a cult for you know, that kind of thing, but let's keep going, don't worry. Now we're paraphrasing page 48. Basically, this is a distorted family structure and dissent or pointing out flaws in the belief system will bring out flaws on, in the leader. And the leader is scared of this because he wants to remain flawless like a deity. So he must squash dissent by making his dissenters seem inferior by comparison to the exclusive superior cult club atmosphere that makes members feel like they're above everything and special because of what their status is. Also, all cult leaders are authoritarian by nature, and that's obvious. Now we go to page 78. When the leader's actions or words conflict with the sacred beliefs, there must be some cognitive dissonance in place so that he can still look good and perfect. This dissonance will then affect a lot more aspects of the cult followers' critical thinking just as people in general, because once you start viewing things through that mindset for such a drastic level, it's really gonna fuck with you. The leader is also at the mercy of the group in some ways, because if they try to withdraw or step away or get caught, they will cannibalize the leader. So the leader really, his own creation could destroy him. And he has such an ego that he probably wouldn't think of this until it's too late. Now we're going on to the last one, page 101. Bad values are attributed to the other, the outsider, the inferior, to do not listen, i.e. bad karma and bad things happen to them. This makes the followers feel safe because they chose the right path and the cult is like a shield from those bad things. So now on to Suseska. The website looks like something out of the 90s, but that's an insult to bad web page design in the 90s because it was still better than this. It has not been updated since the fucking Stone Age and is still full of nonsense. He also has a slightly more recent video on the subject, but it has some contradictions, although the way he talks about it is just a good way to show how fanatical and egotistical he is. These are our primary resources and our other source is this really helpful video I found from a mental health channel that breaks down all of the things. I encourage you to watch this video, it's great. So Anision says that he originally started Suseska, I'm just gonna call it Seska, it's just easier to pronounce, in 1997 when he was 11. Which sounds like a lie. We all believe in dumb things when we were 11, so if he said that he had the idea forming in his head since 11, it would be fine. But we know Onision has a superiority complex, so he says he started it as if it was a fully formed idea when he was 11, like he was some mini cult leader who was much smarter than other kids. In this video he says he started it when he was 17. Interesting. I started a religion when I was 17 called Suseska and uh, I followed it for like a year. He acts like he doesn't believe it nowadays and certainly doesn't push the cult as much, but I still have the impression that he wants it to work. And the only reason he stopped pushing it was that it didn't work as a cult. And he moved on to his videos to try and make that cult work instead, which it did work as a way to lure young people into control and make his ego grow perpetually. It's not about him truly believing in his insanity. Even if he does, it's it's about his ego. So Pseska, according to him, believes in karma, the earth, and reincarnation on other planets, and souls. Basically, he copied a lot of Eastern religious values and pretended they were his own. As someone who comes from a very heavy, heavily Buddhist family, it kind of triggers me. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest here. I have enough to irritate me when it comes to Tumblr white girls like Simply Kenna who don't understand how Buddhism works but also pretend that they do to seem interesting without putting the work in while putting fucking pot plants on Buddha heads and now I have to deal with Onion. Also, his entire religion sounds like a bad JRPG. Like, I feel like I played this religion on PlayStation 2 when I found it at a bargain bin when I was 9. So they believe that everyone on this earth has souls, and these souls have lived past lives. We have our souls as a spirit version of ourselves. The soul is called a savant, and there is a spirit realm, souls reside, called a devant. And the spirits reside there to wait their next opportunity to come to the physical world. With understanding the fact that Suseska is universal, it doesn't believe that everything is rooted here on the planet Earth. It involves everything, and that the universe is composed of two parts, the physical realm, and the spiritual realm. It's about the universe itself. The universe is about the universe. And what is the universe? It's the physical the um, and the spiritual. Now, just as there's a physical realm and a spiritual realm, there is a physical part of us and a spiritual part of us. So the physical part of us 
would be our body, and that is just a vessel. Some of them can decide not to and just wait, and sometimes they can even choose what life they want. For example, if they plan to live a more difficult life or live on another planet if they wanted to. Earth is not the only world in the physical realm, as there are many planets and they live together like they all form like a spectrum of bad to good. The good planets can go from better places to easier to live lives to straight up heaven, where there is no disease and death and bad things. The bad planets are generally harsher environments to live on, and otherwise planets with a lot of bad people who are very dangerous. Your soul has the ultimate goal of transcending as a being to be able to live on the good planets up in the heaven sector. This is done by your soul having karma, and it's kind of like, think of it like a loyalty card for a store that you like, like the more you shop there, the more you rack up points that you can use for discounts and stuff. The points are collected by being a good person and suffering. The good person doing good deeds and avoiding the temptation to do bad deeds, and suffering because going through hardship gives you good karma. So Onision explains, a soul can fast track earning extra karma points by saying, hey guy, for my life on earth I'm gonna live a very difficult life on purpose because I want to get extra points, because I'm close enough to getting enough points to go to heaven that I'm gonna just do the extra creds. And this also gets confusing because if you're a bad person, a person who loses karma, you will be given a bad life or hell on a hell planet because of this. So how can someone tell if someone is facing a hard life because of them being a bad soul or a good soul that is choosing to face the hard life? Like if something happens to you, you could say that you deserve it because say Seska teaches you that you need to pay for being evil. Or if you're a good soul and a bad thing happens to you, you could say you asked for it and on the bright side you're ge getting good karma so it's okay if the bad thing happens to you in the end. Um, but you just go through all these experiences and you, you, you grow and you grow and you grow. Um... So, yeah, when you die, you have a choice. You could say, I want to be somebody who has a very hard life. And that way, when you overcome these things, you wind up skipping. So, in one case, you're victim blaming, and in another case, you're belittling the trauma and experiences of a victim. And if you kill someone as punishment, you will be murdered in the next life. That means that someone else has to be a bad person and get bad person karma to murder you, and it, the cycle goes on and on good karma by doing good deeds or responding to our environment positively. But then herein lies the contradiction with these uh, sinful acts and the method and procedure to salvation. Again, we haven't defined what is actually good and bad or good and evil. We haven't defined what actually garners us good karma and what garners us bad kar karma. Not only that, but Onision stated that what a we do in a life will happen to us in our next life and this creates a spiral downward that no one can ever escape if i murder someone in my life and i'm going to be murdered in my next life that means somebody has to murder me which means they're going to be murdered in their next life which means somebody had to murder them and it's this never-ending cycle of somebody being murdered or any other sin that you can think of but what's most scary about this is that it implies that if something bad happens to you, then that's because you did something bad in a past life, or you did the same thing. There are some souls who never have come to live on the physical realm, and these are called the Zodin. Zodin often make the mistake of being extra violent when they come to the physical realm for the first time, because they do not understand what it is like here yet, but they are learning with time. He explains this is an example of a kid hitting another kid but then getting hit back and realizing why hitting is a bad experience once they have that experience for themselves so they stop hitting kids. You start to, as you grow, look at others and how they suffer and sometimes experience that suffering yourself and if you're a, a person who's reasonable, logical, somebody who wants to be the best impact to others that they can be, you stop behaving in a destructive manner over time. It's kind of like how children, you know, they'll hit each other because they don't understand the pain of, be of being hit. And then you show them, you know, that this actually causes suffering and the child begins to learn and they don't hit anymore. Then you have the Shad Day, which are protectors of humans. You see, guardian angels don't work like what we think they do. A very powerful soul that has a lot of karma can use their power to manifest a protective being for themselves that stays in the divan and watches over them. And then we have the evil beings. Gygus, I mean Big G, sounds like something that you'd get from Ikea with the instructions in Chinese so you can't figure it out anyway. These are the negative spirits. His explanation for demons. 
So he based this off of that demon experience we read before. It's still crazy. What do you do to get more karma? You ask. What are the sins? You ask. Well, sins in general are just stuff like bad things, like murder and rape and all that shit. Which, you know, whatever. Good deeds are the good things, but, but this is also very earth-centric. So, you need to take care of the environment and whatnot. As we know, Anision is vegetarian, so this is not surprising. To, to live and survive and thrive, and over time we have just kind of turned our back on the earth, and that in Saseska, there needs to be a focus placed on protecting the earth and uh, giving back to the earth since it has given us so much. He says we were put on this earth to nourish it and be its guardian, but we have lost that goal along the way. And the reason everything sucks now is because this is a consequence for losing that goal. And we need to take care of the earth, lest we all die out so it can develop a new race who will take care of it instead. So the animals that are not human, because Onision doesn't seem to think that humans are animals, but I am here to remind you that we are, humans aren't special, we all suck. Animals that are not human have souls, and these souls are inferior to humans, but once they get enough karma, they will become strong enough to be promoted up the ladder and be can become a human, essentially. So he's saying non-humans, like, they're, they're not as pure, so they don't they aren't as good as humans. I would say the complete opposite, though. I don't see Golden Retriever Jeffrey Dahmer tearing it up at the pound. I don't see birds in the forest having a Harvey Weinstein issue. And the Earth itself is a learning planet for our souls to go to. In other words, the Earth is a basic bitch tutorial level that we need to pass in order to go to one of the other levels. Now, keep in mind, when he brings up God, he acts like there's something out there with us. And in fact, he says that there are most likely multiple gods. He says that we should not wait for them because they would take so long to get there that they, even if they decided to come talk to us again, that it wouldn't matter and if they hadn't abandoned us in the first place. It's funny to me because he seems pretty staunchly atheist to me. Now again, I'm not mad, I'm not religious at all, but there is a contradiction here. You believe in a being or do you not believe in a being? Keep in mind that he says he made this up when he was 11 and he has a book called Reaper Creek about an 11 year old boy that becomes God. That's strange. And if you're wondering, I will be getting to the books at some point. Onion has also never said this, but there are some people in the community who seem to think that he chose the name Onision because Oni means one and Sion means divine community. So one divine community. Because of his failure of his first one, he comes to YouTube to make his second divine community and creates his forums in the hopes of gaining loyal followers. Another part of the community offers a slightly tongue-in-cheek alternative view. Oni being Japanese for meaning something like a demon, and Sion having the alt definition of an imaginary place. A place existing in one's head. So Anision is a demon existing in his mind, e.g. Big G. On the 3rd of Feb 2013, Greg tweeted out that he started a religion because God told him to and Seseskins just get it, but everyone else doesn't. This could also be a tongue-in-cheek because he says that they should worship him if they want to, but then again Anision thinks really ego-driven things all the time, unironically, so I have no idea. First, this post from Anisian, and it was posted on February 23rd, 2013. He says, the reason Sasesco was started is because God spoke to me directly and told me to start the religion. Saseskins just get it. We just know things and do things in a more efficient way than others. All other religions, thousands of them I know, are an insult to the true God, that which is only represented accurately in Sasesco. If you wish to worship perfection, well, you could worship me, but that's not what I mean. Then worship God, the God of- One last thing I want to mention is that he marketed his religion when he first started it by spamming message boards on similar topics saying that he was a random dude who happened across a religion called Seseska and wants to invite people to check it out because he thinks he likes the sound of it. So he was a spammer and a scammer. And we're all out of time today. I hope you enjoyed the look of the series. In the next episode, I will continue his website endeavors and childhood memories if they are cringe enough to stick around and the pre-onion days, if you will, and get started on his channel from the beginning with Sky. Also, uh, I figure that in between Anision videos, I would try to do like the sillier topics, if not just lighthearted topics, because I know how heavy this stuff gets, especially when we start talking about his victims. So I want to really space this out as to not affect anyone's mental health, including my own. So the next topic is probably just going to be some stupid shit, but it's going to be fun anyway, so I hope to see you there.